continue to study the benefits that are wrought for us by God in and through the blood of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you are uh, new here tonight, we just want to welcome you. We're so glad that you're here with us. Uh, if you are looking for a church, then uh, uh, may tonight, as hopefully every Sunday, we don't change all that much, may it be a, uh, a, a welcome and an introduction to you of us, that we, we preach the Bible, we preach the gospel, and we exist to see souls who are far off from God, uh, forgiven and transferred into God's kingdom through faith in Jesus, and then joined to a church where they start uh, learning and growing and then preaching the gospel to others. So uh, uh, that is what we're all about. It's called the Great Commission. That is our central purpose and task here at Hope Reform. Baptist Church. Amen? Amen? So in Colossians chapter 1, we are introduced in verse uh, uh, 19 and 20, let me open up there, uh, to this consideration of reconciliation, and that will be our consideration tonight together. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19, we are of course cutting right into the middle of what is a glorious and wonderful uh, passage, but thus we must do on nights like this where we are preaching more or less topically. Here we are in verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Who is the him? Jesus, the Christ, the incarnate God in man where the Colossian heresy and heretics had been teaching that a real God, a real powerful God, a spiritual God, a good God would never live in this filthy stuff we call flesh. He stays away from it. He didn't even create it. Some kind of demon God created this stuff. And here's what salvation is. Taking us out of the world, separating heaven and earth and taking us out of the world into heaven, into the spirit realm, and never reconciling, reuniting, or permanentizing a kind of relationship between heaven and earth. Amen, said the heretics. Heck no, said the true believers. We say this, in Him, in Christ, the man, Jesus, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, fully and entirely exhausts all of the divine essence and attributes and yet poured himself into or assumed upon himself in the incarnation a true, rational, physical, uh, finite human body. Anyway, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth, the physical realm, or in heaven, the spiritual realm, making peace by the blood of his cross. May God bless this word in our midst this evening. Amen. The main idea for tonight is taken from those two phrases that we see in verse 20. Uh, first of all, he says that God was in Christ to reconcile to himself all things. Reconciliation is our theme tonight, and its own definition is right there in the following of the verse where it says that God was reconciling the world to him, that is, making peace. That's what reconciliation means. It means to find enemies. It means to find people who are at odds, who are out for each other's blood, who have hostility in their relationship, who are sworn enemies, who uh, we might use the technical language of enmity, they are alienated relationally, and what reconciliation does is it brings them both to the table. It dishes out some kind of uh, agreement, sometimes a sacrifice or a payment, and it effects peace between them. If they walk away from that table, their hands have not shaken. They are not at peace relationally. It was a failed reconciliation. Reconciliation actually and effectively brings peace between two enemies, and that is what Paul has the audacity to say was taking place on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the end of verse 20. Peace was made by the blood of Jesus' cross. So that is our theme tonight, how the cross of Jesus Christ makes peace where there used to be enmity between us and God. God is everywhere in Scripture. Though a man of war, a warrior, a judge, a punisher, he is also shown everywhere to be the peacemaker. That is that he is the one who initiates and pursues to make peace because he does not delight in the death of the wicked, the prophets tell us. So to study, therefore, the fact of reconciliation, first of all, we need to get to the heart of the fact that there is a need of reconciliation. To even speak of reconciliation, this is why sometimes I don't like in the politicals, I don't get political in the pulpit. 
Maybe I do. I don't know. It's not my point. My, my point is to preach the gospel and, and see souls saved. But, but there are some times in political language where we talk about the reconciliation between the European and the indigenous. The reconciliation between this race and that race. Now, if those two races are not in sworn warfare, stop using the language of reconciliation. The Australian government does not need, for example, I never get political, does not need a ministry of reconciliation between two people groups unless there is or unless they want us to believe there is some kind of enmity and warfare and blood oath. Is there that? Or is there merely disparities? So the language of reconciliation, Luther used to say, you never ever have to reconcile scripture. You never reconcile scripture to scripture because that assumes one of them is contradicting the other. You never reconcile friends. You don't have to get them to agree. Scripture always agrees. So this is not merely uh, topical language, right? It's not merely uh, surface level uh, imagery uh, language that God is using. Uh, uh, it's like we're at enmity with God, but it's not real. No, this is real and true relational enmity between God and his creatures that have fallen into sin called mankind, you and I. Uh, This is a real relationship of wrath. Last week we were speaking all about the wrath of God as it pertains to his law and his holiness. So that the wrath of God was being mediated through condemnation and punishment and anger. Tonight the language of reconciliation assumes alienation or enmity. And that is to speak of his wrath in a relational sense. In a legal sense, your relationship with the judge doesn't matter at all doesn't matter if he and you are from warring clans. It doesn't matter, at least legally, if you had just scratched his Land Rover on the way into court. It doesn't matter if he's your your physical neighbor on the street and you are fighting about the fence and the tree and the rubbish and which night bin night is, etc. Your personal relationship with the judge should, in effect, in a legal system, should never affect the sentencing you get because he's giving you impersonal legal uh, sentencing. In the wrath of God's law, we see propitiation through the blood of Christ. That was last week. Tonight, we're seeing that relationally, us and God are also estranged. Not only legally, but relationally. We are alienated from God, and we are enemies. This flies in the face of the modern, postmodern assumption that not only is there no such thing as evil, uh, but God really has no right, that he is in no place to tell us we are wrong. It's cute that the ancients thought that, but God actually doesn't exist in a place of authority. Rather, uh, uh, he, can, he can and should accept us as we are, as we choose to be, as we self-express. There is no moral hierarchy. In the modern world, they would say of God that we, uh, 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 and mankind, that mankind was so, uh, 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 that we were evolved, we were progressing, we were developed. There, there really is no innate evil of mankind. There's just things like lack of education, Lack of resourcing, lack of science. And so many of the uh, Westerners, for example, believed in a civilization which would thus bring about salvation. We need to teach them running waters. We need to teach them technology. Teach them of the Western classical Roman legal system. And then we will have evolved humanity and peace on earth. But peace doesn't come by learning or education or civilization. Peace comes by the blood of Jesus Christ. So modernists don't really believe that we are evil to the core, but biblical Christians, mark this, biblical Christians, and if you want to be one of them, mark this, do believe in the innate fallenness of humankind since the Garden of Eden. There was a time when man was with God in peace, inalienable from him, in great relationship with him, so that God would look down on that. We read that there's only one chapter in the Bible. It's so short, it's so tragic. But it is where God says over the world, this is very good. This is good. This is good. This, all of creation was good in, in what uh, uh, the Hebrew mindset is whole. The language was shalom. It was peace. It was perfect. There was no estrangement or enmity between man and animal, man and wife, uh, uh, man and neighbors. He had no neighbors yet, of course. Uh, Man and the elements, man and weather, man and his own work and his labor. Everything was perfect, blissful, happy. It was Hebrew mindset was shalom. It was peace. But into that came sin and rebellion. And then God cursed mankind, all of us in Adam and Eve, because of sin, and he cursed us with 
the alienation, the estrangement, the enmity of every other thing we see in life. So in other words, when we speak of uh, the, the, the problems that man, man has, the lack of peace in our world and in our society, we should primarily think of them. Right? Some people want to want to like, they want to emphasize social gospel so hard that really what the church exists to do is feed the poor and make everybody get, get on together. And that is uh, not an unnoble pursuit, but it is a wrongly ordered and self-defeating pursuit. Because all of the disharmony we see in our world and our society and even creation and in the elements and in marriages and in neighbors and in ethnicities, all of that is a curse from God on the human race because of our lack of peace with God. You cannot fix the peace in every other area until you first fix the peace with God. In fact, a lot of the, pe- the, the lack of peace on earth, we are, we, we are stuck with until Jesus comes back and recreates everything in the new heaven and the new earth. Until then, you can't get rid of some of the lack of peace on earth. So, so the church's job is to preach the gospel of peace. And here we recognize that we are, because of our sin, in a state of alienation, hostility, and enmity with God. If you don't believe that, close your Bible and walk out and go somewhere else because there is no good news of the religion of Christianity. There is, there is no redeemable part of the gospel that we preach and the religion that we uh, uh, adhere to unless you start here. We were created by God good and at peace. We fell in sin and are now inwardly enemies of God and he is enemies of us because we are lawbreakers. You have to start there. Psalm 5 verse 5 tells us this. Speaking to God, the psalmist says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies, for the Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful human. There is enmity, not just us towards God, but God towards us. He really does abhor sinners. Or Romans 8 verse 7 says the other way as well. Uh, where the, the, the unbeliever or maybe the, um, uh, uh, the, the liberal Christian wants to say, oh, it's not quite like that. We all have an innate divine light within us and we all love God if we, if we just uh, uh, get to know the right kind of God and surprise, surprise, the right God always ends up looking just like you. Very lovable. All right. uh, but as long as we meet God on our own terms and according to our own uh, acknowledgement of our own privileges and biases, if we meet God rightly, oh, we all find out that we truly, truly do love him. We don't hate God. Paul disagrees. Romans 8 verse 7 says this, of the person who is still not born again, whose mind is set on the flesh. He says, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. The language there is of hostility. I was was, uh, debating, let's say. Uh, My hands were in my pockets and not up, so it was a debate technically. And we were talking about, uh, I was defending the hostility of man, the hatred of God. We all by nature hate God. We don't agree with him. We are hostile against him. And this liberal Christian had the audacity to look me in the face and say, that's not true. I love God. I said, you're literally embodying the verse that says you disagree with God. I just showed you a verse that says you hate God, that's why you disagree with him. And then you said, God's wrong. I don't disagree with God, we're in perfect unity. Wow! See, you forgive what I did next. No, I'm I'm kidding. (laughs) Mankind, myself, you, if you're a Christian, born into this world are naturally in hostility and alienation. Not just God to us, but us back to God. God cursed us because of sin, and in our sin we continually curse God back goes on to say in Romans 5 verse 10, while we were enemies, enemies, get that word into your head, by nature we are enemies of God, that's a relational language, we were enemies, and yet, the good news of verse 5 is this, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, what a rich verse that shows to us tonight our main theme and our main purpose. God is not an enemy to be trifled with. 
He is not one that you want to meet on the open field without counting the cost. Jesus used this language. He says, count the cost of discipleship. You know what it's like thinking that you'll front up to God without faith in me, without trust in me? It's like a, a small tribesman who thinks that when the Roman Empire has sent legions of armies across the, I'm, I'm elaborating Jesus' analogy, uh, uh, against the plains that this tiny little tribesman with his sticks and maybe some sharp rocks good, good job weapon, and then run across the field and seeing tens of thousands of cohorts of legionnaires, of soldiers, of Roman uh, swords and, and the, the, the aquila and shields and thinking, I've probably got this. That's what it's like. Don't, you need to count the cost. You must count the cost. Coming before God in open warfare on judgment day is not an end that produces success or joy, but only judgment. God is not, therefore, to be seen as an equal. It's not like you and a neighbor who are disagreeing. It's nothing like that. And we can start there by analogy, thinking, oh, disagreeing and being disunified with somebody. Ooh, we can picture that. Or maybe ethnic relations or, or, or nation states that were fighting. Yes, we can understand. Oh, nations or, or, or cities or countries that wage war against each other and declare world wars. We, we can conceive of that. In another sense, it's nothing like that. In another sense, it is nothing like that because God is God. And so our need is absolutely in reconciliation. And therefore, from the need of reconciliation, we can look at the gift of reconciliation. Romans 5.10. Let me read it again. I love reading this verse. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We were reconciled. This is a finished work. That means that reconciliation is not something we're being invited to achieve. You're not being asked to contribute. Do what you can. Join the forces. We're trying to reconcile ourselves to God. God has given us a chance. He's waved the offering. The white flag is still up in the middle of the field. If enough of us join forces and, and turn sides, he might accept us into his own kingdom. Not the case, not the gospel call, not what the church exists to do. There is reconciliation, full stop, accomplished, finished, in the past through the death of his son that God did. God has reconciled us through the death of his son. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That's a parallel passage in another book that Paul wrote to our main verse tonight, which is Colossians 1.20. Through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In Christ, God was reconciling the world, the enemies, the haters, the aliens, the estranged. He was rec he's reconciling us to him. We can use by a measure of a, a comparison as we sort of peruse and study and assess the gift of reconciliation and how it is a free gift of God to us. It helps us to compare it towards other historical or, or, or uh, 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 real examples of enmity and reconciliation. Uh, there was, uh, of course, in the Greco-Roman world, uh, the, the, the idea of reconciliation had perfectly been popularized. They knew what this meant. That is that warring nation states, or some of the barbarians maybe, as the Roman Empire uh, had waged war upon them and decided to, to uh, take from them their lands and establish, you know, the Pax Romana upon their lands and all praise be to emperor. As they waged war on a nation state, it was the job, if they didn't want to be completely destroyed, or like the Germanics, put up one heck of a fight for a few centuries. But if you didn't want to be completely destroyed by Romans marching armies, your job was to declare some kind of reconciliation, some kind of surrendering peace offering that requested from the warring superior power, please don't kill us, here's an offering, please receive us, please make peace instead of warfare upon us and our children. This was the reconciliation they were familiar with. Or maybe the Roman Empire simply would arrive or Alexander the Great in the years of the Greeks beforehand would arrive upon an empire's doorsteps or arrive upon a city's walls or arrive up to a nation and they would demand payment. Demand payment or there will be war. Make this payment or we will destroy you. But again, in that picture, the weaker, uh, the, the offending party, 
the weak, the one who was going to be destroyed anyway, they are the one who makes the payment of reconciliation. They are the one who come with something in their hands in order to reconcile. The Roman Empire never offered to any other empire, nation, city, state. They never offered terms of reconciliation. They never gave a sacrifice in their honor. They demanded it back towards themselves. So we can think of the Old Testament in 2 Kings chapter 12, when, uh, when, when King uh, Jehoash pays King Hazael of the uh, Syrian army. The Syrian army turns up on Jerusalem's doorsteps, uh, starts working its way through the fields of, of Judea, making its way up to the mountain of Jerusalem on Mount Zion, and the king and all of his uh, diplomatic political savviness empties the temple of God of its sacred golden objects and sends them via a convoy to the marching army of the Syrians and says, here's an offering, here's a payment, please be merciful to us, may we have peace, and the king of Syria allowed peace. Or you could think of King Aethelred. He's called, history has unfortunately named him uh, uh, in the medieval ages of Britain, of England. He was called uh, Aethelred the Unready, right? the unrepre- pre- unprepared one. Because as the Vikings were coming over to Britain and were waging warfare and moving down, he was so unprepared, his, his warfare, his army so weak, uh, unable to put up a defense, he simply paid very willingly one of the largest pieces of Danegeld ever done in all of history. Are you familiar with Danegeld? That is the gold that they paid the Danes, the Vikings, and then declared themselves victors. <laughs> this, is, this is British. This is where the French got it from. The, the Vikings would come down. The, the, the unprepared king would just empty their bank account, and he paid 48,000 pounds of silver to the Vikings, who then turned away and went back to uh, Daneland. Uh, and then the king had the audacity to claim himself a victor. I'm a brave, brave king. I have paid for them to go. That's called losing. (laughs) They just raided you without having to blunt in a sword. That's what that was. Nonetheless, we see this picture in the very human level of reconciliation. The one who is at the risk of destruction. The one who has everything to lose if this, retali- if, this, if this relationship of alienation continues on in its heightened heat of blood thirstiness. If this re- re- relationship does not arrive at reconciliation, I'm going to die. It's that person who brings the gift of reconciliation, who makes a peace offering and establishes peace. In the gift of God that we see all through the language that we've read tonight, reconciliation is not made by man to God. God is God. He risked losing nothing were he to end this heated relationship between man and him. He has spoken, he has spoken into existence millions of galaxies that could represent and number every single sinner that has ever lived on earth. He has nothing riding on your reconciliation to him. He loses nothing just as easily. He could re-speak an entire uh, 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 cosmos of more universes and worlds into existence where he would not be sinned against, where he could protect a fall from ever happening. And then, so with that, we could ask, so, so God gained nothing. He didn't even like it. Did, did he want reconciliation? And why, for, uh, for goodness sake, why didn't he just stop sin from happening in the first place? Here we come to the sovereign plan of God in history. That his ultimate ideal, his ultimate pleasure, and his ultimate design was not merely to eradicate enemies and then have a world of those unfallen people bearing his image. His heart, his decree, his design, his plan of salvation was to allow, by the devil's instrumentation, by human sin, was to allow enmity to come into history between himself and his image bearers so that he might bridge that. He might build that over. He might span that chasm and bring about reconciliation so that he is not just a glorious creator. He is not just an amazing judge who can thwart, destroy, and flatten his enemies but that he is a gracious, loving God filled with compassion and love. That's what God desired to be known as, wanted to show himself to be. That is why 
when we were enemies, God reconciled all things to himself through the blood of his son's cross, who he gave to reconcile the world to himself while we were still enemies. God, the all-sufficient one who could have destroyed us, gave of himself through his son so that Christ was the fullness of God and reconciled all things to himself. This is that reconciliation is not an achievement of mankind. It is a gift to mankind. We have not uh, 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 conversed. We have not uh, compromised. We have not been brought to the bargaining table and in our diplomacy have bartered out a relationship with God that is mutually beneficial, right? This is not wartime relations. This is cosmic sin with the judge of the world. He came in his son and effected and procured reconciliation and made peace really without us. The only thing we had to do with it was the butchering of his son on the cross. That was, that was what we contributed. We as a human race, the, the, the Romans by their uh, procurate uh, uh, pilot and the Jews by their conspiring as a religious body, we all together as a human race captured him, lied about him and butchered him on the cross. But God's part in all of that was bringing about our reconciliation in that moment. That brings us to the thought of the cross of reconciliation. How is it that God in the cross, in the blood, in the death of Jesus, how did he then bring about a reconciliation? How does that affect reconciliation? And Isaiah 53 tells us that the how of reconciliation is this wonderful word, substitution. This needs to be, Spurgeon used to say, this needs to be at the front and center of your mind whenever you think of your religion. Anytime you think of Christianity, if you're asked to uh, define Christianity or, or, or quickly summarize, or maybe you're asked this at school kids, you know, if you could tell me what's the whole point of your beliefs in, in one short sentence, I pray and I hope that substitution, at least in its meaning, is in that definition. Substitution is so important in the life and the mind of the Christian that if you don't think about it, if you don't understand it, if it doesn't really have a place in describing how you are made one with God again and put at peace with God, if you could describe how you become at peace with God again without the language or idea of substitution, you don't have a gospel and you're not at peace with God. The way that we can have reconciliation is through substitution. And that means that Jesus on the cross, by his blood, as God's son, with the fullness of the divine being in him, Jesus gave himself to be in our place. So that as God's enemies, we were transferred out, Jesus was transferred in, and suffered as God's enemy. Jesus died for us under God's hostility. Jesus bled for us, enduring the alienation that we deserved. That's why verse Five of Isaiah 53 says, speaking prophetically about Jesus, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. It's entirely one-sided. He takes all the cursings of the relationship that we had with God. He takes... Even the curse of, that, that, that infl was inflicted upon the world, right? Adam was promised thorns will afflict you as you work, and Jesus was crowned with thorns. Even the created realm went dark as he died under God's judgment. Every cursing, every element of alienation that mankind had been uh, condemned to suffer as sinners, Jesus suffered in our place. He died alienated under the wrath, under the alienation, under the uh, 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 displeasure, under the hatred, the abhorrence, the uh, uh, enmity of God, so that those who were his enemies might transfer into Jesus' place and become sons and friends of God. Isaiah 53 in that verse, he says, Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And it comes back to Colossians 1.20 as the main, the main idea. That's what reconciliation means. So we can now talk about the effect of reconciliation. 
We had a need of reconciliation. It was a gift of reconciliation. It happened at the cross of reconciliation. And what is the effect of that reconciliation? And is that glorious word, peace. We have peace with the one whom we used to have enmity. We have peace with the one who used to look upon us in abhorrence and hatred, Psalm 5 says. We have peace with God. The effect of Christ's reconciliation on the cross is at least fourfold, and that's all we're going to explain tonight. The fourfold peace that comes upon a Christian. And the first peace is an objective peace. That is a peace that happens on the level of the law. This has nothing to do with how you feel. This has nothing to do with your experience. This happened long before you were ever born. And it was true about you before you even recognized it or realized it when the gospel was preached to you. This is the simple fact that in offering himself on the cross, Jesus offered himself first and foremost to God. God sent him to offer himself back to God himself. This is a Trinitarian, this is a God-centered gospel. God does the saving, he saves us from God, and he saves us by himself. God offers his son, his son offers himself to God. God receives that uh, payment on the cross, and thereby he has effected peace with us. On the level of the law, Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is that you and I used to be war enemies. We were in the Syrian army, yelling out cursings against the God of Israel, taking our javelin and hurling it at watchmen up on the wall, graffitiing, defecating, destroying the temple of God. That was us. We were war criminals against the holiness of God. But now, because God has made his son to endure his wrath and treated his son as an enemy, he now says, if you throw down your arms... Throw down your javelins. Throw down the flag of the enemy and come to me. There is peace because my son has paid your crimes. The war crimes, the war criminals against God, the enemies against God can be received as kingdom members and citizens and in fact members of the divine family. Every Christian, that is anybody who has placed their faith in Jesus desperately in the hope that he will save them from hell, you can say, The law has nothing to say to me regarding my crimes against God. I have been declared innocent of my enmity and I have been assured of friendship with God. That is objective peace on the level of the law. You are justified. You have a legal peace with God. He's never going to come searching for you to pay the crimes that you owe. You owe no crime. Jesus took it all. But then secondly, we could say, that there is a peace on the experiential level. There is objective peace by the law. There is also an experiential peace, we could say, on the psychological or on the spiritual, on the soul level of the human. That is not a peace that is exacted by the law. That, that law. That peace has already been established in the cross. But then on your level, what we might even call the level of your acknowledgement, this is when you realize That objective peace has been accomplished. This is when you understand the gospel. This is when not only have you trusted in Christ, but then you've learned what that trust in Christ procures and receives. You learn about the benefits of salvation in Christ's blood. And then you have what we might call a psychological level of peace, an experienced peace, or as the writer of the Hebrews says, a peace of your conscience. Many Christians die with a guilty conscience. It's just a false guilty conscience. Let's say this. Many atheists die and go to hell with a clean conscience. It's just a falsely clean conscience. You know, a false clean conscience and a false guilty conscience. And Christians ought to have a clean conscience. Because you know that before God, you have peace with him according to the law. But, but if you are in a state of worried about your flesh, worried about your sin, and, worrying, and umming and ahhing, will I go to heaven or hell? I've trusted in Christ, but who knows what that might lead to? And, and maybe you're in a church that doesn't preach clearly on the, on the effects of the gospel, and, and then they die. Do they enjoy any less of heaven's bliss because they had a guilty conscience? Not at all. 
Now, a guilty conscience and a, a being or cleaned, having a, having a peaceful conscience in this life has everything to do with enjoying the blessings of the gospel. And God would have you not only go to heaven by his son's blood, but to enjoy the promises in heaven through Christ's blood by understanding the words about Christ's blood. I don't just want you to go to heaven. I want you to go to heaven and know now that you're going to heaven. So Hebrews speaks about this in the language of chapter 9. And on the level of the acknowledgement, on the mind level of the Christian, the writer says this, If the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with ashes, if that could sanctify for the purification of the body, that is to say in the Old Testament with all the sprinkling, and the, I mean, if God would allow... And a, a defiled person to enter his earthly holy place just because he got sprinkled with some blood and killed an animal. If God would allow that, now that was not a saving purification. No one went to heaven after that purification. They were cleansed only on the level of the fleshly ceremonial activity. Had nothing to do with their soul. Zero to do with their conscience. It just let them back in the building of the temple. And yet, Hebrews says... If God allowed, even on that level, for blood to bring peace, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That is, that when you recognize what the blood of Jesus means for you, hence this series, when you recognize what the blood of Jesus accomplishes for you, there is an experienced, soul-level, psychological, spiritual joy at peace with God, and nothing compares to that in life. Horatius Bonar wrote in a hymn, A mind at perfect peace with God. Oh, what a word is this. A sinner reconciled through blood. This, this indeed is peace. This kind of fellowship or peace of conscience, this relational peace that we have with God was pictured for us in the Old Testament. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, again, here's your reading assignment for Sunday night. Leviticus chapter 3 and chapter 7, don't fall asleep or God will judge you. Leviticus chapter 3 and chapter 7 describe one of the kinds of sacrifices that the Levites and the Israelites were to make. I wonder if you recognize, know that there were many different types uh, of uh, sacrifices they were supposed to make. A guilt offering, a, 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 a burnt offering, a peace offering, a grain offering. And there was this peace offering that they were commanded to make. And this is, maybe something has happened in an amazing way in your life. And you want to bless God, thank God, and celebrate with God. You're invited to come into the temple with a sacrifice. Or maybe you've, you've made a vow and you want to seal it in relationship with God. Or maybe you've fulfilled a vow and you want to come and say thank you to God and, and remind God you, you've accomplished your vow that you made. What you would do is that you would bring your family usually because you have to eat a whole animal. So you need a family. They would take their whole family and a sacrifice with some bread and some oil. They would go up to the Levite, wait in line like a, like a dream world, and they would finally get to the front of the line. They would offer up their little, their little uh, uh, maybe a cattle or, or sheep or a goat, and they would offer it up, and it would be killed, and its blood thrown against the altar. Again, without the blood, uh, the spilling of blood, there is no remission of sin. So there is that reminder for them again, blood in a bowl, bowl splashed upon the altar. But then also they would divide up, like, like, much like a butcher might in a, in a show, they would divide up the, the portions of the animal. Uh, certain parts would be burned. The fat would be burned to God as a pleasing, beautiful aroma with some oil and flour. The best parts of the animal were apportioned to the priest so that he could eat it. And the rest of it was taken by the family, once cooked upon the altar, taken by the family to go and... I guess have a picnic inside the temple uh, a courtyard, sit down, sing praises to God, and eat. And this was called a fellowship offering or a peace offering. And the, the imagery that God had woven into that was intentional so that it was not just a, a picture of blood covering sin, but it was a picture of the effect of blood covering sin. It was to show that not only was, was that man and his family free of guilt, but also that he was 
welcomed into relationship with God. It was literally picturing a picnic, a family meal with God, with the priest, and with the Israelites. This is pictured for us to show the glorious peace that we have with God on a relational level, where Jesus, the mediator and priest, God in heaven, and us as sinners are welcomed into a divine love feast forever and ever. Amen. Then there is also, thirdly, we've spoken of the objective peace on the law of the uh, level of the law, uh, a experiential peace on a psych- psychological mind level. Then there is also peace with man, and this happens on the social level. Matthew 5, verse 9 says this Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus was speaking of relational behavior, man to man and woman to woman and cousin to cousin and friend to friend and enemy to enemy. Those who go out of their way to make peace with others instead of heaping up warfare and retaliation, blessed are you, you will be called people who look just like God. That's what it means, you're a son of God, you you look like him, you're acting like your father instead of the other father, the devil. You'll be blessed. Jesus pronounces a blessing upon those who pursue relational peace. And this is also pictured in the Levitical sacrifice that the the priest and the family of the Israelites were encouraged to have a meal together. Those who are forgiven, forgive much. Christians who recognize the peace that God has brought about in their life between them and him are quick to share that forgiveness and share that peace with other people. This is most seen inside the walls of the church. It should be the case that we are forgiving and we are peacemaking with others, but Jesus still said in another portion of his preaching, don't think I came to bring peace but a sword. And in that sense, he meant that those who deny and refuse to be made at peace with God and those who refuse to be called sons of God and make peace with others, they will sharpen their swords and speak with vile enmity against both God and his sons, the Christians. So in that sense, there is, there, there is an enmity between Christians and the world. And, and as much as possible, Romans 12 tells us, we should be at peace with others. But where we can't, we refocus on the peace that there is in the church. And this is where the New Testament shows us such a rich uh, ethnic, uh, religious, cultural background brought all to the same table of the Lord's Supper. They they all pass through the same water. They all receive the same gospel and members in the one church. This is where our our backgrounds melt away as we we recognize our deep level of unity and peace one to another. And on the fourth level, the peace that Isaiah 9 verse 6 calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. And this is why. Because he brings peace between the king and his enemies, you and me. Because... He he delivers to you and I the good news of peace so so that we recognize that peace and fellowship we have with God. Also because he mediates and brings peace, not only between us and God, but also through us and through our changed affections to those around us. And and he can change entire people groups and, and lifestyles. He does that. But there is an ultimate and final stage of, of peace that God brings to mankind. And that is what Colossians 1 verse 20 was really pointing towards ultimately. And that is the absolute peace. We could go back to the Hebrew idea of the Garden of Eden, shalom. When it won't just be between God and man peace. It won't just even be between Christians most of the time peace. It will be absolute, objective, irrevocable, under every stone, within every atom, the elements of creation, every single person, even you and yourself won't fight. Anybody else looking forward to that? You or the seven people in your mind that argue with you all of the time, even you will be at perfect peace. There is a peace coming in the new creation, what the Bible calls the new heavens and earth, which occur when Jesus come back, ra- comes back and raises us all back to life. And then there is perfect peace between God and man. He is satisfied to be looked upon by his redeemed face to face without separation, alienation or a veil. We look at God face to face in the eyes of Jesus Christ, his eternally incarnate son, and we enjoy then absolute creation-wide glorious peace. But reconsider Colossians 1 verse 20. Through Christ, God was reconciling to himself all things, whether on heaven or in earth, making peace 
by the blood of his cross. We could get overly optimistic or naively ignorant and start to try and twist some puzzle pieces together and say, well, if Jesus is bringing about this continually growing, ever-expanding, uh, incrementally glorifying peace, surely there will, there will be a day where, well, they call this universalism, where eventually there'll be no such thing as enemies of God. You know, doesn't he say he's going to reconcile everything? So there won't be any enemies of God. And, and, you know, it's not just that there's a glorious world in the new heavens and the new earth. It's that there's no hell either. Oh, it's been emptied. All God's enemies eventually wooed over by his gentle love. And all things then will be reconciled. That's what reconciliation means, they think. But here's the warning. The Colossians is speaking of a dual-edged reconciliation. That is, that every king that we see pictured uh, in the Old Testament or in those great Psalms which speak about not just David but Jesus, the son of David, part of his reconciling work, part of his peacemaking work is waging warfare against his enemies, chief of all Satan, but also all those who refuse to bend the knee to the King Jesus. That means that when Jesus comes back, he will not reconcile everybody in a heavenly kumbaya and forget that people disobeyed and rejected the gospel. It means that he will make so whole and so complete his justice that every sin will be paid for. Either on the cross of Jesus by his blood, which reconciled the redeemed, the Christians, or he will reconcile all of the accounts to God's justice by sending finally all those who remained enemies of him into the lake of sulfur, hell, and torment for their burning and for their suffering. That, that is what is still to come. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but he makes peace by the blood of his cross, and then he makes peace by his final judgment, where he doesn't pay for anybody's sin on the last day. He just deals with it. So my call to you is receive the offer of peace. Receive this gift of peace. The king is marching every day that turns over on our calendars. The day of Jesus' return where he comes with all of his glorious angels, with the authority of his father to destroy and vanquish his enemies, including you if you don't believe in Jesus. That day is getting closer every minute. And you are called by Jesus. You are called by the apostles. You are called by the Bible. You are called by me in this moment. Make peace with God by believing upon his son who bought you peace before he comes back as judge with no more peace left to give. Make good on the promises of peace before they expire in his return and we don't know when it will be. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who willingly gave himself for you to buy what the Father willingly wanted to give to you, which is reconciliation and peace where there was once alienation for your sin. Let's pray. To have opened up to us by your holy prophets and apostles, Lord God, to have opened up to us all of the, all of the, the aspects and the facets of the blessings that are in the blood of Jesus Christ is a true joy. And I pray, Lord God, that this in, entire study would, would have the effect on our minds of, of, of helping us to realize and then declaring to us the peace that we have with God. I do pray, Lord God, that, that some who are saved and going to heaven right here tonight, but who are still so racked with guilt and who have false guilt because they fear your judgment, would you speak peace to them and give them a level, on the level of their mind, would you give them peace because they trust, not in themselves, but in the blood of Jesus, who offered himself up without blemish. Father God, I ask that those who are still far off, who are still, using the language of your scriptures, they are still enemies of you right now. Or at least they came in enemies. They came in reviling you and at enmity with you and alienated from you, whether they realized it or not. Lord God, I pray that those who have come in like that would leave your friend would be made right with you, made friends to you, made at peace with you right now through trusting alone on the blood of Jesus, which justifies, which cleanses, which saves, and which pays for all of our sins. Pray, Lord God, that you would give this salvation, that you would uh, set our hope and our faith on Jesus Christ alone, and that you would send us out in great joy and in great peace to serve you and declare the ministry of reconciliation to a lost and dying world. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty and wonderful name. And everybody said...